So uh, I just wanted to go over a couple quick things. First of all, uh, the big thing is last night when I was going over all of lecture four and then preparing just in case I had time, if I'm lucky enough, I might get to go lecture five and then realized I got to do lecture five today instead of lecture four. So things are slightly going to be slightly out of order. And by slightly, I mean a whole switcheroo between two lectures. The reason is because I don't want you getting uh, caught flat footed for lecture for the uh, project two task, which is task analysis. During the lab time, I do believe that's this week. Of, of course, I'm going off memory for a lot of stuff and my memory's faulty. So if you, know, if you notice something wrong, please let me know. But from my recollection, today's or this week's lab on Thursday should be covering the interviews, which you should your group also should sign up for if you have not done so. Those interviews are designed to get you an understanding of what your task is, what you're trying to solve, who your users are for your main course project. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And normally I, I was originally planning on doing it Thursday uh, because I wanna talk about data today, but we'll just switch them around. We will get to data. data we have this nice you know, um, dovetailing between talking about data and our visualization design techniques and, and the like uh, that we were doing before. We were talking about um, efficacy and um, what's the other one? Oh my God, I'm blanking on the terms. Uh, the idea that if you're choosing your data, you choose the right channel for the right data. So you take the highest priority channel for the highest priority data that you're trying to convey. And you also choose the right type of channel for the data you're trying to display those two things. Uh, so what we're doing today, we're going to, we're going to have a very, very, very awkward in class exercise later on. The reason it's going to be so awkward is because normally I do this in person and it's awkward in person. It's not so bad, but you got to get used to it very much like coding or playing the piano, skiing, skating, whatever you do, right? The first, when you first start doing something, it's kind of awkward. Sometimes it can be fun, but most of the time when you're talking about human interaction, it's a little awkward. And that's doing the interviews. You need to try at least one trial run with somebody else before you start talking to me because it's just not improv, right? You have a plan. So let's get going on this. Um, provided, I don't know how many people we actually have here today. Do we have a full load? We seem to have a full load. Great. So I'm going to be talking about tasks just again, because I had to shift things over. So uh, we're going to do a little bit of foreshadowing. This is what we're going to be doing next time on Thursday. So in case you're wondering, so what we're going to be doing on Thursday, we're going to talk about uh, grids, uh, sampling, and things like when we're talking about fields of data, we're going to talk about different types of data, data, uh, data sets, what kind of data sets we can have. We can have tables, we can have grids, so continuous data. Uh, we can have geographic data. Uh, Left me. I think it's on the next slide, anyways. Nope, that's attribute data. Huh. So grids, geographic or geospatial, actually, is the proper term. Um, fields and oh, and networks, the big four. And you can have various combinations of those. But how you frame what your data is tells you how you approach how you visualize it. One more thing, though is that we also can break our data attributes down into multiple different types. We could take any given attribute, let's say uh, your GPA. Uh, yeah, you guys have a GPA here, don't you? Uh, Queens doesn't, depends on the university, right? Some data is continuous, as in um, the length of something, right? You can measure it to any level of granularity. We sometimes have ordinal data where small, medium, and large, there's no there's no granularity between. You don't know the difference between a small and a medium, but they are one is greater than the other. That's whole, the whole Starbucks philosophy. What's Vente? Uh, I don't know. It's big, right? How many? How how big is it? I don't know how many ounces it is, but it's big. And then there's categorical data, like countries on a map, where there's no ordering per se of this. You could order it alphabetically, but really doesn't have an ordering. Uh, colleges, fruits, kinds of fruits, that sort of thing. Um, 
So, and then we're going to, we looked at marks and channels already. And we looked at how marks could be used for encoding the date itself, the items, or also how to link things together. But we also had channels, which allow us to encode bits of information on a mark. So if you have a point, you can change the size of the points. Or you can make it a different shape, or you can make it different sizes. And then what we're going to be looking at is this. Actually, we looked at this already, but we're going to look at another bunch of these sorts of things uh, where there is actually a perceptual ordering effect. And when we get to perception, we're going to be seeing this again that why we're good at this one way or versus another way. But the reason we have this is that we need to know for sure that if I'm gonna present um, ordinal data, I choose the right encoding for the kind of data, it's ordinal data, and how high priority it is, because I can choose multiple different ways of encoding that. And so the highest priority with the best encoding for the data type is the way to go. And you're consciously choosing how you're mapping things to different attributes, to different channels, attributes to cha different channels. And so what we're gonna be looking at is things like this, where although position is awesome for all of these cases and position is sort of the gold standard, the best way of doing it, there's only so many positions you can have, right? So if I talk about length for, oh, wow, that sounds, um, let's say the length of a line so in, in a bar graph. Well, the length of the line of quantitative data is terrible for encoding ordinal data. And it is even worse for encoding nominal data or categorical data where there is no ordering effect. And so we'll look at those in a little while. All right, and there's our data, there's our data sets. See, told you. Okay, so we're gonna learn about tasks today though. And the, it's gonna be a bit of a shift but once you know how, how do you know the big thing here is, let me go back a second and say, we have this ordering effect. And I said, you got to figure out the right type of data and how important that data is. And my question is, how do you know what the important data is? I'll let that sink in for a second. If I have a data set, and I know, and I'm presenting it. You cannot display all possible combinations of the data. You can't present all possible, you know, you can't let them do anything, anytime, any way they want. It is the kiss of death. And it is actually what, why Apple suddenly took over market share, a lot of market share after a little while, after, after a lag, actually quite a big lag, because they were more expensive. Windows did everything for everybody and that was the problem. So let's see, this is just this so graphic user interface on, uh, you know, fun, but let's do this. All right, here is just, I have a Word document open. All right, Word has gotten considerably better in the last little while, right? But I could do things like, oh, I have references, I have layer. Okay, so tell me, how do I run a macro on this thing? Actually, I don't know how to make, run a macro on this thing anymore. It's one of those things I learned a long time ago and uh, probably in here somewhere, I don't even know, right? Why? Because there's like four people that run macros. I mean, there's more than that, but it's like 0.1% of the population runs macros. Most people want a darn word processor. That's all they want. The reason I'm bringing this up is you can't be everything to everybody. And so Microsoft has finally learned this, but for the longest while, they just threw everything in a bunch of buckets and said, go figure it out. And what you end up having is you have very low priority tasks that only a very, very small subset, but vocal subset of people wanted. And then everyone else had to deal with that thing being in the way. There's only so much your brain can take. And if you overwhelm people with the amount of options, the amount of data, the amount of whatever, they won't, it won't absorb properly. We won't be able to find it. And it's frustrating to everybody, not just the one person. You know. uh, and so what you end up having to do for graphic user interface design, the, a lot of the art form of it is just weeding out the stuff you don't need, putting it into low priority areas, like the options menu. When you need it, you know to go to the options menu and you'll eventually find it. 
but yeah, you don't, you know, you don't throw everything up front and center. The front and center stuff should be for things that most people need. But in order to do that, you need to know exactly what the task is, what they're using it for. And it's extremely hard with Word. But when they did the research on it, they went, oh, this is what most people are using Word for. If I know what kind of data is the most important data for me, that's the stuff that has to be front and center. And the only way to figure that out is to know what the task is. To know what their use constraints are, what they're using it for. And although you might say, I want it for everybody, you know, I want this thing to be useful for everybody. And everybody that does this in their, in their project one, it's just common as anything. If you say, I want everything, you know, this to be useful for everybody, uh, you're going to miss the point, the, miss the mark. Find your representative user, the person that you need to make sure you nail this down for. That's your, that's your gold standard. That's the person that you have to make it work for. And then you can expand it out. That's fine. And if you're a big product, big company, maybe you have several personas, several representative users. But if you are, um, let me see here. You don't try and mix up a first person shooter and a kid's game at the same time, right? You just keep them separate, right? It's, you don't want this weird uh, combination of different things for everybody because then it doesn't satisfy anybody. So, and I think that most, most game systems now do that. They're, they're very dedicated to a particular target demographic that they're looking at. Um, so we're going to look at the tasks that they're doing and not just the user. You need to know your users, but you, then you need to know who that person's, what that person's task is. And we're going to figure out the different levels of classification for a task that I will give you some preamble warning here on this. It's not exhaustive. It's not an exhaustive list. The list I'm going to give you is sort of a feel for how you can categorize things, but you can come up with your own categorizations. You just got to figure out if it's high, medium, or low. Everyone's going to just think of it as an exhaustive list, uh, at least unless you're better than other group students I've taught. Uh, and then we're going to figure out how to classify tasks a bit more. Okay. So I want, this is not going to be submitted because we're going to spend a couple, only a couple minutes on this one. I want you to think about this particular task. Okay. How would you make a visualization for stockbrokers on the trading floor? So grab a piece of paper, doodle out something. How would you make a stock market visualization? What did, what stocks, um, you know, if they're trading stocks on a stock market floor, what should they see? What kind of representation should they use? So I'll give you a couple seconds for that and just quickly draw out your ideas, a minute or two. Okay, how is everyone doing so far? Hopefully you have some rough estimate of what kind of thing you might want to be demonstrating for a stock market broker. If you're trading stocks on a, um, you know, in the TSC or the uh, New York Stock Exchange, what kind of thing would you look at? All right. I'm positive all your ideas were beautiful looking, but they're all wrong. 
<laughs> that's the reason I only want to give a couple of minutes. They're not wrong, wrong, but I wanted to illustrate a particular point that we don't know anything about the task. And so as a first pass, great, but you're definitely not going to hit the mark because it's almost impossible to hit the mark without knowing who the user is and what the task is. And quite frankly, I know nothing about uh, exchanging stock or what a stock mark, uh, stock broker does. I know very, very little about that entire world. And your job is not to know necessarily be the expert in that particular domain. It is not to know everything about that domain is to find out from the experts in that particular domain, how the heck to do all of this stuff. That's the point. You don't know it yourself. You ask others how to do it and you find out what their task is and what they need from you. So for example, we don't know what market. The TSEs might be very, very different than the New York Stock Exchange. I'm assuming it is. We don't know what stocks we're dealing with. Is it high frequency traded stocks? Is it regular stocks, blue chip stocks? Is it, um, let me think of it. Are you just looking at stock market trends? I have a friend at, in Boston who's a British then moved to Canada on a whim, then became very good at his job in Canada. And then they moved him down to the United States, to Boston. It's a whole thing. Uh, but he changes currencies. That's his expertise, so to speak, you know, as it were. Uh, which was very, you know, I thought he'd be more useful when I was going back to Canada and changing a whole lot of American money over to Canadian. Didn't help. Um, but anyways, he's, uh, that's his, that's his area. It's not stock. Sure. But he's changing or is it, he's exchanging currencies. And there's very, very, very razor thin margins on that. You have to change millions and millions of dollars at a time to make any money by doing that versus a stock where you can sit on hold and wait for it to go up kind of thing. So it depends on what you're looking at. And the time frames are radically different as well. High frequency trading is very, very different than something that you sit on for a while. Warren Buffett does not do day trading. He buys a whole lot of a stock and sits on it for a while. And then it invariably goes up, it seems. So this is the kind of thing with you, if you don't know who your target user is and what their exact goal is, if I'm dealing with something that's high frequency trading, I need something with no lag. I don't care about the prettiness of it. I don't get, I need something to slap me in the face with obvious patterns, but I'm not looking at subtleties. Subtleties are coming from, if I'm looking at this, you know, the, the trade over a long period of time and see historical trends or something like that. I need subtlety in that case. Maybe I need to find more derivative information, but if it's right now trading, I need something that's a very, very immediate. It very depends on, on the task. So we've already looked at the what, what, you know, what's being shown, what kind of data. And then we need to know, so what data is being shown? What do we have available to us? The why is, why are they analyzing it? That's the task. So I may have stock market prices. I don't know why if someone's looking at it, maybe they're looking at it for to short the stock, for example. So they're assuming the stock's gonna go down. Everyone else thinks it's gonna go up. And so you bet against the market that this thing is gonna go down instead of up, right? Uh, why are they analyzing it? They may have a very different motivation than everyone else. And then afterwards, then you figure out how the data is being presented. You cannot figure that out unless you know why they're doing it. So we're going to be looking at the task abstraction. We've, we're going to look at visual encoding very, very shortly. Here's our task abstraction, the what, right? We'd had to figure out, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but we had to figure out what the data looks like, how, how it all is formed together, what the data is. Later on, we're going to be figuring out how to display it. We've done a little bit of that, enough for you to start working on your projects at least, but there's a whole world of research behind that thing. Like how do you filter? How do you aggregate? What's, what's uh, brushing and linking? Uh, how do I navigate in a meaningful way? So how do I encode it? Then later in the semester, we're gonna look at the different kinds of ways I can manipulate, how I can view, have multiple views of the data. Uh, but right now we need to figure out this thing here, which is why the hell we do it. And it might seem obvious, but it's not actually. So one of the things we're gonna be looking at is uh, 
you know, this is a whole bunch of different actions here. We have high level actions. We're gonna have mid-level actions or mid-level tasks and low-level tasks. So low-level tasks are uh, stringed together to compose mid-level tasks and mid-level tasks stringed together or are co uh, compose high-level tasks. The high-level tasks are exhaustive. The mid-level just makes up these higher-level this high-level tasks, and the low-level makes up the mid-level. Okay. And then we also have different kinds of data. So what, what's the target of our action? Is it the data itself? Is it a particular attribute? Is it how things are connected? Is spatial data? This is all based on the kind of data that we actually have, but then that determines the task. So the question is, why are we doing this? And the actual answer, if you not just because I want to waste an hour and a half of lecture time, the actual answer for why we do this is that I don't want to reinvent the wheel every two minutes. That's the reason why this is a research field. It's not just, you know, biologists figuring this out each and every time. Because if I can figure out for, let's say, a library, how to visualize data, maybe that's applicable for some other domain. Amazon, how you find products on Amazon. You don't have... It's not a it's not a one uh, one size fits all approach, but what you learn from one domain can be applied to other domains, and we'll see an example of that with um, oh tree oh, tree juxtaposer. There you go with the tree juxtaposer app. It's very very specifically chosen for biologists for geneticists, in fact. But then it's applied. You can apply those same techniques to in other domains. It avoids domain specific terms and so more, it's so more broadly applicable. So we also have a bunch of visualization tools already available to us in case you're wondering. We have something very similar to this task analysis thing. And so we have very specific tools in some cases, and then we have extremely general tools. So here be D3 is up there in the very, very, very general tools general to the point that that's why we're not fully embracing it. It's just too hard for a second year class in visualization without a whole lot of programming experience before you. And it's also in JavaScript and that's a pain. Right? D3 can do almost anything you want it to do, except it, you need to know what you're doing in order to make it do anything, right? It's like making your own cars. <laughs> I don't know, you're doing your own everything. Tableau is less general, but it's still fairly general. You can visualize almost anything you want. I've seen some crazy things last term with the grad students. Delphi, uh, I never know how to pronounce that, but ArcGIS would be, a. Um, it's only for maps, essentially. It's a GIS system. It allows you to visualize a map in a train. It's very specific for what it's visualizing. Things like MATLAB, also the same thing, right? Uh, a bunch of chemistry visualizations. There are very tool specific things, but you can't apply it to other domains and that's the challenge. So if you make it too general, it's harder to implement, but at the same time, we want something that the general techniques that you can apply in a bunch of different ways. So let's look at some task abstraction. Your actions define, your, uh, define user goals. So what the user's goal is or vice versa, right? The user is trying to do something. So your job is to figure out what that, that person is trying to do and why they're trying to do it. This is actually where my, most of my research comes in. I was a very, very, very specific part of this domain set. But from a high level standpoint, it is, we have two different things for our high level task. We have, we can consume or we can produce. Searching is a mid-level, but here's our mid-level task. So uh, the, the, you know, I want to analyze data. That's a very, very open-ended term. So what are you analyzing it for? How are you analyzing it? Are you producing it? Are you consuming it? What are you doing? What defines analysis? Searching is a mid-level task, as in it's, some, it's a small part of that high-level task. I'm searching for a coffee shop. Now, why are you searching for a coffee shop? 
because I want to uh, discover coffee shops in my area because I've just moved into the location. It could be one part of, I uh, maybe I need to look for coffee shops and this and this and then this. So mid-level task, compose a larger task. And then from low level, it, maybe I'm comparing this coffee shop to another coffee shop, or maybe I'm trying to figure out the distance from myself in the coffee shop. It's part of the task. From an analysis standpoint, we have, we have two main things. We have consume and produce. If you're presenting it, giving it to somebody else to use your data, you're, they are consuming as a general rule. They might produce something, but the, for the most part, they're consuming. And it's a very, most of our research has gone into production. We've looked at how you produce this visualization, how you produce this chart or this graph, how you make um, a slideshow to present to your boss what your visualization does or what your thing does. But suddenly what took us by surprise as a field was like consumption is huge. You produce a visualization, you, you know, roll it out in the web and people look at it, but they're not producing it. They're just, uh, they might be enjoying it. They might be seeing a presentation. The, the CEO watching your visual, looking at your visualization, it's you're presenting to that person. They don't get to explore or they don't get to explore much. It, they're consuming the data. This presentation is a, is, is a presentation. So if I show you a visualization now, it's a presentation of that idea. Uh, or if you just let them play with it, now you have discovery. They can, they can play around and discover things in your data. But they're not making things. Versus if I have a visualization and I tag it for other people to use or tag particular things that I think are interesting, I'm producing something that other people are going to use. I'm producing a tag that this part of now part of the data set. Or I might record what my visualization is doing. More, the, perhaps the biggest one is drive data. So I have all of your grades. Maybe I want to calculate the average. I have all of your grades. I want a histogram of how the grades look. I produce a visualization to let me figure out how the data works. It's not the same as just discovering. It is I'm making a new, I'm making new media. So here would be an example of drive data. So if this is my line graph, I have exports and imports, and what I really want is a trade balance. Okay, so I take my exports and my imports, the difference between the two, or, um, right? The exports minus the imports is my trade balance. That's a new bit of data. It comes from other data sets, but it's a new bit of data. And I, that it would be me deriving new data. Hopefully that makes sense. So that is in itself an action to drive new data. It's a high level action. It requires a whole bunch of other steps in the way. In the way. So what are those other steps looking like? Well, those other steps look like this, right? Here is, I may have, um, so this, we're just looking at search. There's a whole bunch of mid-level tasks that I'm not covering because there's too many. I don't even have an exhaustive list on this thing. But if I just, one of the common ones would be searching. So let's take search. So search actually can be broken into four things. And I, there was a sort of a revelation for me. If I am searching for something, I may or may not know what the target is. And I may or may not know where the location is. Yes, it sounds weird because if I know the target, I know the location, why am I searching? Well, I need to find it. How many of you have tried to put something on a map, like a Google map, where you knew where it was, but you needed to just see it, right? You needed to, it's a whole lot faster than finding it visually. You know where it is approximately, like, like where your house is on a Google map. You know where you live. You know where the map is pointing. You want to find your house. How do you find it quickly? You do a lookup, right? You do a, a search is faster than you manually scanning through a whole bunch of neighborhoods trying to find where your location is. Um, they're doing a bunch of um, changes to the, the zoning and stuff like that for the, the Ottawa's city plan for the next 20 years. I can't remember. Maybe you guys know. Uh, they're trying to, 50 years maybe. Like they have like this big 50 year plan for how Ottawa is going to be built. And I, they, the Alta Vista newspaper that we get to come into our house talked about how Alta Vista is going to be changing over the last, over the next little while. And 
what do I do? The first thing I want to do is I want to find where my house is and where the bus paths and stuff like that, where the, how the zoning is going to be changing for my house, but I need to find it. And it took me two minutes to find it where it was on this freaking map because everything got moved around on me, right? Lookups fast. Okay. So here's a lookup, right? I want Israeli pavilion. Boom. I want to find it. I literally did this search on Google last night, just get it to generate it. And then I've, I've circled it and make it more obvious, but yeah, you put a big pin in there. Boom. That's where you're looking. Okay. If I don't know, uh, let's see what the next one is. Okay. So where's canal building? You might be able to see it on the map. It's actually listed on the map, but I didn't want it to be listed on the map. Or what about, um, oh, there's a, the, there's a whole bunch of different, you know, um, this is Stacy. There's a bunch of different buildings. I had no idea where they were located. And they'd say, oh yeah, just go into this place. And you go like, uh, every class I look up this, right? I get told where I'm teaching my class and I go there. So, um, finding the visualization building on campus, right? I don't know where it's located, but I know the name of it. Fine. If I want to find a place to eat, I know where I'm located. I don't know what's around me. So the target, I don't know what the target is, but I do know the location. I know where I am located right now. I want to find what's around me, or I want to find the coffee shop around me. I know it's somewhere, but I don't know where exactly it is, but I know where I am. And what about what's on campus? That's when I move to a new place. It's a Google map and me exploring around, looking around, trying to find a place. You know, what kind of coffee shops are around my area? What kind of restaurants are around my area? What kind of parks are around in my area? I'm just exploring. It's a very different thing than these other tasks. That's, I don't know what I'm looking for. And I don't know what, where I am essentially, or I don't know the location. It just sort of play around in the area. They are different. And those are all mid-level tasks. Low-level tasks, on the other hand, uh, and this is just a subset, might be identifying the item that they popped up. So when I looked up Israeli Pavilion, finding it visually, that's a low-level task. It's part of the search, but it's only one part of the search. Or comparing which place has the cheaper coffee or is closer to me. I'm comparing two different values. Or maybe I want to figure out, are there a lot of restaurants around me? How many restaurants are around me? It's a summary task. It's, if I'm exploring, exploring the area, maybe summarizing what I've seen is part of that task. So targets are the aspects of the data that we're interested in. So uh, maybe I'm looking for a particular, this is part of my task. So maybe what I'm looking for is the trend line. Maybe I'm looking for what's out, what's an outlier, which is very common, right? Who got the lowest mark in the class? Who got the highest mark in the class? What is the general trend for students in, grades in the class? That's a, you know, or, or is it bimodal? So a lot of my classes, unfortunately, have a bimodal distribution. You get a bunch of people in the A range and pretty much nothing you can do is going to get them out of their A range. They just I, even if I don't teach at all, they get an A, it seems. And there's a group of other pe group of people that, you know, are working hard and, and getting that grade. And sometimes you get a trimodal distribution where they failed, didn't do anything at all, A range, or sorry, passed the class, but, you know, didn't, got like a B, and then the A plus students, right? And those are the kind of features I'm looking for. Uh, I do look for outliers. The person that did not log in to see you learn all term one for one of my classes last term. That those are interesting little why they're throwing off my data so much, right? Or what kind of trend do I have? What's my average? Um, do I have, what's a distribution? What kind of extremes do I have? Do I have, are things dependent on each other? For example, do I have a connection between uh, going to labs in 1400 and the grade that they get at the end of the course? Doing the assignments and the grade that they get at the end of the course. How similar are some groups of students than others? Like the Oh, uh, the um, MPD students versus the, I, uh, the uh, IMD students. Do they have approximately the same grade? Something to be looking at. 
who do they, who knows who? Do I have a connection? So when I have cheating cases, I'm looking at this kind of thing. Who's connected to who? Who worked with who? Do I have some kind of network that's going on here? Or is there a path from this person to this person or the, from this and this? Or maybe there's a general shape to, especially for spatial data. Is there a general shape that I should know? If I'm looking at a brain scan, I want the shape of the, the piece of a neural anatomy. So we're gonna look at the encoding later, but for the meantime, this is where it all comes in, in, in to sort of into focus. I don't wanna go, I'll, I, what I'm gonna to wanna to do is sort of, I don't know if I wanna show you the video or not. Let's, let's show the video and see how we do with this. Let me know if it's too loud or you don't hear anything at all. Tree exposure should be, oh, gotta move it over. Hold on. Ah, oh, come on. I don't know why they're not showing the video, so let me sit, check it out first. There we Oh, sorry. You're not hearing anything. Thank you. Um, I'm hearing something. So why don't you hear? No. Uh, let's see if I can. Or I could just turn up the volume, but then that's on the computer. Um, I'm wondering if I can. Let me see what the best way of doing this. So let me explain what you're seeing, at least for the time being. We, you can watch the actual video originally. Um, oh, check share sound. Where would that be in, in, in Zoom? Share computer sound. Thank you. Nice. The red edges show where a subtree from one side maps to a non should be fine now area in the other. Mouse over highlighting also allows us to check this property on the fly. Biologists call continuous subtrees a clade, and determining whether a clade in one tree is also a clade in the other is a recurring core question. When comparing these larger trees of 4,000 nodes, automatic detection and marking of structural difference is even more critical. Our new navigation technique, where growing one area leads to shrinking of all other places that don't share the rectangle's horizontal or vertical strip, is a new global focus plus context approach called accordion tree. We can manipulate areas that exactly encompass a subtree. I'll stop soon, don't worry. Or freely drag out a rectangle in space that defines an area that we resize. So this is a genetic Keep tree that biologists deal with. Actual biologists are dealing with this. Which allows manipulations of one view to synchronously drive the corresponding changes in the other. Our best corresponding node computational infrastructure supports this functionality efficiently. Unmarked objects, drawn in grayscale, are dimmed according to their depth in tree so that the brightness level is tied to the distance to the root. This redundant visual coding helps users stay oriented despite the distortion-based navigation. Marked objects have a similar coding, where their saturation depends on current screen extent. Marking the differences does not help here, when most of the interior nodes are different because we compare a non-binary tree of 3,000 leaves with a binary one. Marking the metazoa subtree in blue and the Veridiplantae subtree in green shows that despite the difference in interior structure, the leaves are contiguous on both sides. 
Okay, I wanted to stop there because there's no way in heck I I have a biology degree and I don't understand half of what she's saying. I uh, like to also point out the person talking is the person that made the textbook. In case you're wondering, if anyone uh, any of you have actually bought the textbook, um, you know the she has very precise language. <laughs> it's very intimidating talking to her because every word is exactly chosen, and therefore it's very dense and can be hard to to uh, sort of make meaning for it, but she doesn't waste any words, essentially. Tamara Munzner did this research as part of her PhD. And as part of her PhD, she was, um, so she, what she did was she talked to actual biologists, geneticists, looking at phylogenetic trees, how different species are related genetically. And they have a huge problem with these massive trees which all might be slightly different and different interpretations of how the how the how things evolved over time, and you need to be able to compare different bacteria, let's say bacteria, and how they have evolved over a series of uh, a period of time. What commonalities they have between different branches of the tree, what kind that that sort of thing. And it seems, oh yeah, just throw them a tree, but the data is way too big for anything that we had at the time. Way too big for anything we have right now. So she had to go and interview a whole bunch of geneticists to figure out what their actual task was and build a tool to actually support their actual task. Now that's being that tool gets used in a whole bunch of other domains afterwards, but there's no way a normal line graph or something like that, or just a generic tree that like they were using before actually solves the problem. You needed to know what the task was first. Uh, so I like pointing out the tree duct exposure just because it covers all of the things we need. We have this data set. They had the data set beforehand. They need to know what the data set was. It's this tree that they have. And then they need to figure out what they're trying to do, like finding the path between two nodes, for example. That tells you the genetic relationship between two things. And then afterwards, once I have that, then I make my visualization knowing what they need to do. And only then. Can I do it right? Okay. So there's also, she also did a bunch of other uh, research on this in terms of uh, master, uh, ma matches, mismatches, and methods. So how you figure out multiple views, multiple view workflow, and a methodology for how you figure out what users' tasks are, in case you're ever interested and want to have some ni uh, nice late reading afterwards. But we that the whole point is that if you can methodically break down a task into these little tiny com composite parts, now you know what you can do. It's all about decomposing big, nasty, convoluted tasks into meaningful chunks that then you can methodically build on. So if I know what their task is, I now know what visualization I need to use afterwards. So by the way, in case you're wondering, queries, comparing, summarizing, that's not an exhaustive list. So I want to hit the exhaustive list before we do the in-class exercise. So here would be, this is John Sasko's uh, paper. He was, was he my external? No, he wasn't my external, but he was helping me review my dissertation, I do believe. Uh, anyways, this is one of his uh, things for 2005. So old by your standards, I'm assuming, young by my standards, because I'm old, uh, the kind of high, low level tasks that people do. And this is just his view on a series of low level tasks. But if you want to talk about your low level tasks, this would be a useful uh, framework to look at. So things like low level tasks, retrieving the data. I want this particular bit of data. I want to see what the lowest mark in the class was, or they we're gonna use movie things. How long has gone with the wind? It's a very specific thing, right? It's a retrieval task. Um, what did Kiki D sing? That's what I, I had a weird curiosity. Like Kiki D sings, don't go breaking my heart with Elton John. One of the running jokes is like, where the heck did he find this random person from like, did he just find her on the street kind of thing? Uh, no, she's actually big in Britain. I found out that literally that was my search today. What did Kiki D sing? She sang two main songs, one of them being Don't Go Breaking My Heart, but she was had her own singing career. Filter, right? What, comedi uh, what comedies have won awards, the Academy Awards? Or uh, I need to find out the for the people that did any work in Bit 1400, 
what was their average, right? I want to filter out the people that didn't even sign into the system. If I want a computer derived value, like what is the average? What is the standard deviation, right? How many words is MGM one in total? So I got to sum them up. I can't count them. I need to find the most extreme. So what's the longest movie that was ever made? What's the, what film director won the most awards? I need, maybe need, want to sort them so I can make use of it. That's a low, fairly low level test. So you can do, the computer can do it. It's hard for the computer, you know, hard for you manually to do it, but the computer can do it for you. So rank the movies according to the number of awards of one. Rank the movies according to tomato meter. Um, determine the range of different things. So what years were the movie, were various movies in, or what's the range of length of films that have won awards, or, you know, what's it, you know, you're not looking for the extreme, you're just seeing the range. Um, or well, I can, I can go one step further and figure out the distribution. So um, what's, the, what's the age distribution of actors, for example? How does that work? What's the distribution of length of films, uh, length of different films, right? How does that distribute? Is it a normal distribution? Is it a bimodal distribution? Are there some weird anomalies in here? So are there cases where this thing won best picture but no one thought it would. For Scump would be an example. It's a comedy. It's sort of, it's not really following the very serious melodrama that normally wins best pictures, right? Or are there exceptions to the relationship between a number of awards made, uh, won and the total movies made by an actor, right? Is there a correlation? Is there an abnormal, uh, abnormal thing? Uh, number of awards won and total movies made by an actor. There's lots of exceptions to that one. I think any of the... Um, Anything by, by Adam Sandler. Not many awards won, lots of movies. Okay. All right. Do we have clusters? Do certain actors make a lot of things? Are there certain things? Uh, typical film lengths, typical film genres, a lot of dramas win, typically win a lot of the Academy Awards, for example. Uh, Marvel move. my wife always remarks on the fact that Marvel movies keep on getting high tomato meter ratings, despite the fact she thinks they're all the same, but I, the romantic comedies are always, you know, almost universally bashed by Rotten Tomatoes, the Metacritic website, right, for being too derivative. Yet Marvel movies, they're fine, right? <laughs> she always chastises them for that. I really don't mind that aspect, right? These are the kinds of things we're looking at. Is there one more? And there's cor a correlation. Is there trend increasing length over years, right? Is there a trend over time? Is there a correlation between the genre movie or the topic of the movie and the it winning an award? Movies where people dying tend to win more awards, I would assume. Okay. So I want to see, uh, I want to make sure we have time with this. And if we need to, we can cycle back to other things. But I want to give like 15 minutes for this. It's going to be a lot of dead time. And I, it's awkward as hell. Uh, we need, first of all, we need to figure out how many of us there are in here, because we're going to do little mock interviews with each other. I'm going to randomly assign you to other people. So if you're, if the other person in your group is not there, well, what well, maybe I'll do groups of three, let's say. So if there's one person that's not there, not the end of the world. If there are two people not there, come talk to me, I guess. Um, you're going to be submitting your work, just whatever sketches, visualizations you do. And you're going to put it in the homework five. I'll give you instructions, but in the homework five uh, in class submission folder. So here is, I'm going to give some quick interview advice, but what we're going to be doing is you're going to be interviewing. One person's going to interview. The other person's going to be the interviewee. So you just need to answer the questions. Normally, I'd even switch the roles. We might switch the roles depending on the time because you should get experience running an interview and the kinds of weird things that you're going to get. And it seems like it should be obvious. It is not an obvious task. So here's the... Um, we can also have you, if you want, we can self-select. You can have, select your own group, but I have, I have a fear that we're going to have some orphans at the end. We're going to have people that don't have a group at the end. And it's going to be like me playing every sport ever where I get picked last, right? I don't want that to, for some of you. Um, so my normal piece of advice for interviews, and I want to go over this. It's not trivial. It's not something people do naturally. It is something I do. There's a lot of people that really struggle with this task, 
I tend to do it okay for some reason. I maybe because I talk naturally too much, but for your groups, for your project, number one rule: have a des designated note taker, have a designated leader. If the person naturally tends to lead and talk, make them the designated leader. I say this because I've had times where the person that talks a lot in your in the group was the note taker, and then they ended up talking and taking notes at the same time. And you're like, no, 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 stick with your strengths. If the person is naturally schmoozy, give them the designated leader role. Everyone else should take notes if you have multiple people in your group besides that, right? So person taking notes, person interviewing, and then there, you know, every as many people as you can take notes. Well, you can switch up the interviewing task, but the key is you, you, the person asking questions cannot have anything else to do. That you have to let the person that's interviewing just only focus on that because it's too much otherwise. Oh, we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, for P2, you're interviewing me about your project. For this, we're going to interview, I'll, I'll go over that in a second. I'm just going over the advice, but thank you for the question. Uh, what, in, what topics are we interviewing? So number two, be prepared. That means some questions are prepared in advance. That does not mean all questions are prepared in advance. It does not mean random questions. So your job, I should probably make it a bit more obvious here. Your job is to try and extract as much information, useful information from me or from whoever you're interviewing as humanly possible about your topic. Directly asking questions doesn't necessarily get the job done. So if I just grill you with questions like I'm sweating you down at the, at the police station, no, not going to work. So I don't want to, it's not an interrogation. I'm not torturing you. There's no water ports or anything. Like, no, no, nothing bad, right? You're having a nice conversation, but you're trying to get information from the person. So your job is to start slow, start safe, get them to open up, start personal. So you don't start with, so what kind of top, like you don't just start grilling them. People bottle up. You want to coax them to give you information. You cannot hammer them away and get information out of them. They will give you whatever answer you want, but they will not get the real answer. Your job is to start a conversation and slowly extract out the information. It takes some practice. Uh, I personally, this line right here, where is my mouse right here? Make some grant uh, questions open-ended. The grand tour question. A grand tour question is an opening question, maybe a couple questions in, but that's so open that they can, they can fill up whatever space that they want. So let me think of a good one. So we're talking about hobbies soon, or we can talk about um, some of your projects as well. So tell me about what kind of activities you've done to reduce your environmental impact. Grand tour question. It's not very specific. Now you can give me point items or how important is the environment to you? Now, if I say something like that, the answer for many of you would be very or not so much or sort of You want, you're trying to look for a question that makes the person have to answer a whole lot, but not give them so much structure that you know where they're going. Because if you do not know what the domain is, if you do not know what you're looking for, what you want is for them to just spiel out a bunch of stuff at you. And then you take that information that they're giving you and adjust your questions accordingly. You don't know what you're going to get. That's the scary part of this. You're interviewing someone, you don't know what they're going to say, you don't know how you're going to approach something, and when they give you something that's completely unexpected, that's the stuff you explore. So when, so when you're going to be doing interview um, hobby questions, like what kind of hobbies do you have? I don't have hobbies anymore, so let's go with an old hobby of mine. I do Gilbert and Sullivan operatas. I used to do that in my master's degree. First of all, most people go like, you might say, what's a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, first of all, and how did you get into it? Grand tour question, right? 
that is a weird hobby. How did you get into that hobby that you sing operettas in your master's degree, during your master's degree? There's an entire story there, right? And it tells you motivation, why people are doing it, what, what keeps them going and doing it more and more. Okay, that grantor question allows the person to just give you a big overview of the whole subject versus very, spe uh, very specific questions aren't going to give you the full picture. Grantor questions do. Okay, ask what you don't know. Don't ask what you know. Ask what you don't know. So if you know what an guilt, if you know what an operetta is, don't ask them what an operetta is. You know what an operetta is. Don't ask them uh, if you know that uh, there are there's a lot of construction in Ottawa. You don't need to ask them is there a lot of construction in Ottawa or where the construction in Ottawa is or something that you already know. I can't think of a good example right now. Right? You want to know what you don't know, or at least their perspective, if you don't know the perspe their perspective. If you already know the answer to it, you know, David, do you like pie charts? You know that answer. No, I don't. Don't ask the question. There's no point of asking that question. You have a limited amount of time. Um, let them wander. There are people like me that will just blabber on, and you can let them wander a fair bit before you actually have to rein them in. And they will get to things that you may not have expected. But your job is to listen, to really listen, not just wait for your next question, not, not wait for the next moment that you can ask a question. Because if you're listening, you'll find something in what they say that you didn't expect. That's what you're drilling into. You're looking for the weird thing. There may be a problem that you're trying to solve, but you may not know what the solution is. You have to be open to you having things completely wrong and backwards. Um, so, uh, the environmental impact group, for example, wanted, I wanted to have a chat with you guys sometime soon to, to figure out where you, where you want to aim things a bit more closely. Or, but at the same time, you might be really surprised what my responses are going to be. And it's not because I hate the environment or anything like that. I may have a different perspective than you. Everyone here is going to have a different perspective from other people. And what motivates us to do something or why we look at something are very different things. So. I don't think many of us are going to go like, it's a Tuesday. I'm going to look at how the environment's doing. Right? You need to know why they're looking at certain things. Um, you, what you're looking, ideally, you're looking for workarounds and hacks. If they're doing something really crazy and weird, um, so they're walking their kids to school on this weird side street for some unknown reason. Why are they doing it? Because there's a whole bunch of construction and they're afraid for their lives when walking on the main street. That's the kind of thing you're looking for, right? Why they're, they're driving their kids to school and their school is two blocks away. Why are they doing that? That's weird. That's a hack. That's a work on why? Because they're afraid of getting hit by another, by a car. Um, make sure you write down your thoughts and, and impressions immediately after the interview. And the number two thing, the big thing, and I get that someone's going to ask me this on, to, on Thursday and I'm going to look at you with, give me a dirty look. Don't ask what I want. You can ask if you want, but it's wrong, right? You are supposed to be the experts. You're the ones taking in the information. You're the ones trying to make these decisions. You can't say, what do you want to see? If you say, what do you want to see? You will get all sorts of weird crap, right? The, there's a famous, infamous, and probably incorrect Henry Ford uh, quote that if I asked customers what they wanted, they would ask for faster horses they would ask for faster horses that don't die, that don't need to eat hay, that don't need to be rested, that they would ask for a car. If, you, if you've teased into it enough, you'll realize that they're asking for an automobile, a horseless carriage, if you will. But until that point in time, if you just directly ask them, they might say a faster horse, but they're actually, you're trying to tease out is what their actual pain point is. They might be doing it wrong. They might be doing it in a weird way. And that tells you what, what your opportunity to fix things are. Uh, but you are the experts. So don't ask them what kind of visualization they want. You have a particular task. You're trying to figure out what they're trying to do and how you can support it with the visualization. Okay. That's the general advice for interviews. Here's the actual thing. We're going to be visualizing your hobby. So think about a hobby or a course that you took or something that you do. 
hobbies. Most people have some kind of hobby. I've had some people that all they do is walk for a hobby. That's not so interesting, but even watching too much Netflix is technically a hobby. You can make a visualization on it, but many people have hobbies from video games to, uh, collecting various things, collecting Pokemon cards, to playing D&D, to whatever the case is. You'll talk to each other. One person has the hobby and you're interviewing that person. The other people are gonna interview you. Uh, one person interviews you at least. And you're trying to understand the task itself and the possibility of, and the kind of data that they're dealing with in the task. So let's be very clear. It's not just talking about the task in general, the kind of data that they end up dealing with, what kind of decisions they make, what kind of things that they're doing. And you're thinking about questions you uh, interviewees while they're asking you questions, think about the questions you would ask, maybe write them down at the same time, but you're, you can provide them feedback. If they missed a golden opportunity, you can let them know, right? That's part of the feedback loop. We're gonna take about 15 minutes to do this. Yes. And five minutes for the design task. So 10 minutes for the interview, five minutes for the design task. So here's what we have. The instructions break into groups of two, three. I'm going to make a group of three, one person. So just in case we have no shows that are just sitting there, uh, but you can still put your name down if they're your group of three. And we're going to talk about your task specific, uh, domain specific tasks. And afterwards, when maybe either take your notes, type down your notes and you can submit that. Or if you do a lot of visualization to show somebody, you can submit that on the Google Drive and talk about it. Okay. I'm going to make random groups of breakout rooms of students here. And we're going to go from there. And what I might do is I might drift into your, your room just to give all their illustrations because it comes up that people go, well, we talked about it for five minutes and we're done. And then you'll see me do it, do a trial run on you guys. And you'll, you'll see why it takes some practice. Okay. So let me, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a while. Actually, I'm going to stop recording. Uh, so